the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We just deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may life in your will and walk in your ways. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in His holy consolation. For Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the day of Pentecost is from Numbers chapter 11. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. <clears throat>
since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet John. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on our flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and the signs of the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall return to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. The great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that every one who calls, who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The text is the Gospel lesson where Jesus cries out, Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is our text. So as I began to prepare for this sermon, I remembered the fact that there was a nine-foot water main out in East Houston that broke last year and reduced water pressure in the city and caused a little bit of consternation. And lo and behold, I got an email from the city of Houston yesterday afternoon indicating that they were going to cut into and repair a nine-foot water main out someplace in East Houston, and that perhaps there would be low water pressure in Houston for about 12 hours. And I don't know about you, but when I got up this morning, the, the shower water pressure was just fine, so they must have gotten the water main completely repaired. I do wonder if the mayor was paying some attention to my, uh, to my sermon preparation, though. We get a little bit anxious when we think about the fact that there might not be enough water pressure. Or perhaps even none at all. What then? If there is no fresh water when you go to the kitchen tap or to the refrigerator or when you turn the faucet on for a shower, nothing comes out but dust. What then? Fresh water is essential to life. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he gets up on the last and greatest day of the feast and says that rivers of living water shall flow into the hearts of his people. He's talking about the very giving of life itself. The ancients were very concerned about water and water quality. You can imagine why. Because the average household sent mother to the well with two rather large jars on a yoke every morning so that there would be water in the house. There wasn't running water. There were no taps. No one had a bathtub, heaven forbid. Can you imagine the odor? It's like being locked at home during the COVID virus. The ancients also recognized that stagnant water or still water might be polluted and indeed might be ridden with disease and they were very cautious about this because they knew it was a life and death issue for them they always sought to have a supply of living water that was the best water for the ancients why what was living water for them living water was a moving water course continually replenished from upstream, clear, drinkable, life-giving. So you can see that when Jesus stands up on that last and greatest day of the feast and talks about living water, all of his hearers knew exactly what he was talking about. That he was talking about water that gives and sustains life and that that water wells up in the hearts of believers with this incredible abundance. He's talking about rivers of this stuff. And so what God gives to us as a gift, we have the blessing of returning to the world in flooding rivers of life. Pentecost Day is the day when we pray for that overflowing water from God so that we can allow it also to flow out of us to a world of desperate need. This Old Testament lesson with famous Eldad and Medad 
Um, I don't know if you know this, but their father's name in the Old Testament was just Dad. Come on, I work on these. And of course, El Dad and Me Dad simply disappear from the Bible. They're mentioned twice in consecutive verses, and then they're gone. The 70 elders with Moses are prophesying. And of course, we think, yeah, prophecy. They're telling the future. Well, no, that's not what it means in the Bible, generally. It means that they were proclaiming the great things that God had done for his people to save them. This all welled up in them because the spirit of Moses had been placed on them. But interestingly, Numbers then says, but they did not continue prophesying. They apparently just did it once. And then Joshua comes and demands that Moses shut Eldad and Medad up with prophesying in the camp. What does Moses say to this? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And what Moses is doing there is prophesying truly about what happens on Pentecost. Because the Spirit of the Lord is poured out on all flesh, and all have the Word of God placed on their mouths. You are a royal priesthood. You are a people belonging to God. You have the Spirit. You have the Word of God in your mouth and in your hands. And that's why streams of living water, rivers of it, can flow out from you to a world in such desperate need. The psalmist talks about this when he says that God turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell. We all feel this hunger and thirst for God. But he slakes that thirst with his word. And they establish a city to live in. This is the kingdom of God on earth. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. Some 40, some 60, some 100 fold. By his blessing, they multiply greatly. I'm always amazed, flabbergasted actually, by the generosity of God. Why should God be so generous to me? Why should God continue to give me his word and spirit and in such generous, overflowing abundance that it can flow out of me as rivers of living water. What have I done to deserve this? Nothing. And indeed worse. Why does God do this? If we're to receive His blessings in word, if we're to receive His mercy and forgiveness, if we are to receive the divine speech, it must be by grace. Otherwise, we will not receive it. If it depends on me, thank God it doesn't, then I'm in a lot of trouble. God pours out His Spirit on His people in generous abundance. And that's why I believe that God has tied the giving of the Spirit, this is God's decision, not ours, of course, He's tied the giving of His Spirit to the sacrament of baptism, where there is a pouring out, right? It's water. And of course, our font is living water, because it's always moving. God pours out His Spirit on His people through this great sacrament, and we receive all of these blessings and gifts in great abundance, and then we turn around and give them away. They're so abundant that you can't give away uh, more than God gives you. 
It's so generous that you can give away everything you have and you still won't have no lack. And in baptism, God has staked his own reputation on us. Why? He signed you. You're his masterpiece. Right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Marked forehead and heart. You're redeemed by Christ the crucified. Bought back from sin. Cleansed. A new person. The Spirit of God is on you. And if he's giving us his word, and he is, then we are able to take that word into the world. All of you are eldads and dads. You have to be. The abundance of God is so generous that it should just simply bubble up into great richness in the world. I love tautologies. This is a tautology. God's word is God's word. Of course it is. I love this text where Jesus says, the scripture has said, notice even God's son quotes scripture as authoritative. He's a believer. Of course, is his word after all. But then he says, out of his heart, whoever believes in him, out of his heart will flow rivers of water. In other words, what God says happens. He gives this generosity and abundance to us beyond all imagining. God's word then is placed in our hands so that we can share it with a friend or a neighbor. God's word is placed in our mouths and it graces our mouths and shapes them rightly so that we can bless and not curse, so that we can speak words of peace and forgiveness to those who have sinned against us. And he's placed his word in our hearts. Now, it flows out as rivers of living water. And how important this is to us. We get to comfort those who share our struggles with us. The Apostle Paul, in this text, we, we often share at funerals and probably not much else. It's unfortunate, really, because it really applies to the whole Christian life. Where Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction, not just when there's death or grief, but in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So God comforts us so that we have the opportunity to comfort those who also have affliction. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Notice all that abundance and sharing that Paul's dumping out upon us. These certainly have been difficult months. Doesn't seem like it could possibly be that long, and yet it is. These are the dog days of COVID, so to speak. I don't actually know directly anyone that's had the disease or died. I do know people who know people who have had the disease and indeed died of it. Most of us are in my situation. We know it's out there. We know that people are suffering. I don't know about you, but when they announced that there were 100,000 deaths, finally, 
this past week. I, I felt my heart sink into my gut. It's hard to even consider what this number means. The result for us is that though we don't know anybody who's sick, there's a huge psychological impact on our lives. And it doesn't matter whether you're watching Fox or CNN. You feel it in your heart. It's difficult. We do need God's comfort in the midst of our anxiety. And he gives it with his word. He gives it with generosity. He gives it by the power of the Spirit. He gives it to you so that you, in your comfort, might also comfort those who share in your anxiety. And maybe we're most called on in these days to share that hope with the people with whom we're closest. Why? Because we're semi-quarantined with them. We have no choice but to share this comfort, which we ourselves have received with others. When I was about 12, my family bought property out in the country and moved out there. As a child, I was not particularly happy to move out to the boonies, but it did have its benefits. We got a dog. That was great. And we had wonderful water. Water I still remember. There was a well in the backyard, a drilled well. And you turn on the tap in the kitchen, and out of that tap would come 40 degree water, crystal clear, sparkling indeed, and full of wonderful tasting minerals. And as the glass filled, you could see the glass beginning to fog on the outside because it was cold. That was the most thirst-quenching drink I'd ever experienced. And I thought that everybody had water like this. And as I aged, I found out that nobody had water like this. I miss it, especially in the summer around here. Well water was beautiful and clear and sparkling. In Waterloo County, where I'm from, there are artesian springs all over the place. You can just stop on the side of the road, stick your face into a little pool, and drink the coldest, freshest, sparkling, mineral-filled water. Oh, delicious. Now, if I'm any kind of a preacher by now, you're fairly thirsty. And then if you're not awake, it doesn't matter. This is the power of living water. It quenches our thirst. It overflows with mind-boggling generosity. It is useful to bring comfort to those who are suffering, assures of the presence of God, delivers His own word to us, and every blessing. Yes, indeed. God's word is poured out to flow out. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, life of life, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and 
Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but have free course. Bless all newly planted congregations that they might endure. Protect, encourage, and bless all missionaries who proclaim the gospel of Christ crucified to a world still walking in darkness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have ordered all things in heaven and on earth. Bless Donald, our president, Greg, our governor, the Congress of the United States, and all elected and appointed civil servants, that they might serve with wisdom during these trying times. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have given our nation the gift and heritage of freedom, which has come at the cost of many lives on battlefields far and near. Receive our thanks for their service and preserve the members of our armed forces, especially Andrew Coulter, Jack Ogden, Heidi Baker, Robert Baker, Donald Erke, Alyssa Brim, Nathan Hunt, and Julia Murray. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, have mercy and spare us. Put an end to the pandemic. Restore the communities of the world to their common life. Grant work and courage to the unemployed. And lift up those who are lonely and isolated. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you are the giver of every good gift and you care for us in all our needs of body, mind, and spirit. Hear us on behalf of those who suffer, especially Joanna Carner, Michael Kutzadonis, Luann Weber, Jimmy Keller, Zane Stonebrain, Sally Carver, Gloria Speckar, Kristen O'Hara, Lucille Herter, Ed Jetsy, Myron Carter, Les Coolidge, Anita Marquardt, and Ruth Campbell. Comfort also the families of all who mourn, especially the family of Mary Chocolate. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you are the giver of all life. Be with all pregnant mothers and their children, that we would be eager to guard the sacred gift of life you have given. We especially thank you for the birth of Mary and Ravi Jyothi's baby boy and ask that you would guard and keep both mother and son in the safety of your hands. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have graciously provided us a place at the table of your altar. Grant that we who come to this table to receive the blessed supper of your son's body and blood might come in true repentance, confessing our Lord and trusting in his forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else we need, we ask you to grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you.